West Germany has two Fokker 50s, Australia has another two, and so far the countries are unique. The aircraft only came off the production line a month ago, and Australia will have another four by the end of February. They cruise at 510 kilometres an hour. Today, local media, business and travel industry representatives had the chance to try the new aircraft for themselves. The plane will go on public display at Williamtown this weekend. The F-50s will replace the F-27s used by Air New South Wales. The company's general manager, John Hutchison, says the F-50s replace 30-year-old technology. He says the new aircraft is quieter, faster, more stable and fuel efficient. They cost between 13 and 14 million dollars each. However, Air New South Wales has received a discount due to a six-month production delay. We've had the odd problem with Fokker in delays, but uh, they've turned out an excellent product and uh, we've been able to operate with the F-27s. Uh, the Fokker company decided to produce two totally new aircraft types and I think that puts a strain on, uh, on a relatively small company in a billion dollar business. But I think the Fokker company are in good shape. Like clogs, they're part of the Dutch culture. They won't disappear. The $3 million single level wool store covers an area of more than 14,000 square metres. It replaces five multi-storey wool sheds which stood for 30 years on the Hannell Street site. The new wool store is capable of holding up to 21,000 bales and Elders says it expects to move up to 60,000 bales through its stores this year. The official opening comes a day before the fourth series of Newcastle wool sales for this financial year, which could help to explain the 500 wool growers who came from as far away as Moree to avail themselves of Elders' hospitality at the opening ceremony last night. One thing was certain, however, no matter how many turned up, this venue was never likely to be overcrowded. Managing Director of Elders Pastoral, Michael Hamilton, who opened the wool store, says it's one of the most advanced in Australia. Well, there's a great deal of efficiencies in this type of store. We've built similar stores to this now in South Australia, in Adelaide, at Lara, Geelong, and we've got a great deal of expertise in designing stores to improve efficiencies of handling. And modern techniques require a single level store such as you've got here. The old traditional wool stores were two, three and four storeys, very expensive to operate. Mr Hamilton says he is confident of the future of the wool industry, both for the hunter and for Australia. Wool is riding the crest of a wave at the moment. I think it's encouraging that we're looking to celebrate our 200th birthday next year and in a sense we're back to where we began. Australia on the sheep's back is its first real industry and doing very well at the moment. There's, there's good solid demand for wool right around the world. Australian wool is in high demand and auction prices reflect that. Plant and wildlife illustration is a particularly specialised area, but in Newcastle it's an area that has taken off with a select few at the CAE and the standard is remarkably high. The field was given a boost in 1984 with the establishment of a plant and wildlife illustration scholarship from an anonymous donor. The scholarship of $1,500 each year is open to students enrolled in the plant and wildlife illustration course, which is part of the graduate diploma of art course. This year the standard was outstanding, with a series of entries by four students. Environment and Planning Minister Bob Carr had the task of naming the judge's choice, Anne Young from East Seaham. While at the CAE, Mr Carr took time out from the illustrations to release the Lake Macquarie Environmental Audit Report. He denied strongly that the report was just an attempt by the state government to appear to be doing something about the Lake Macquarie pollution problem. He said the report showed definitively that steps were being taken in a number of areas. He admitted, however, that what he called the lake's diffuse source pollution was not proving easy to mop up. Well, we've tackled the problem of toxic metals in the lake. There are no more of those going into the lake. We've put controls on the thermal pollution from power stations. But the problem we're left with is a much more complex one. It's the urban runoff from all the suburban areas in the lake catchment. Now, it's that that's causing the problem of nutrients and of sedimentation. And it's a much harder problem to address than a point-specific discharge from industry.
New Gas became a wholly owned subsidiary of the Australian Gas Light Company in 1980, and so in Newcastle the celebrations took the form of a function at the New Gas premises in Hunter Street. Civic and business leaders attended a ceremony in which the Lord Mayor of Newcastle, John McNaughton, and the Deputy Mayor of Lake Macquarie, Gordon Hughes, were presented with commemorative plaques and a piece of history, a video of the Aberdeer Gas Works outside Cessnock, which were closed down four years ago. An exhibit of historical photos on display at the centre throughout this week tells the story of gas through the decades. It was used for street lighting in many Australian cities and towns right up until the First World War, although electric street lighting became available around 1910 and gradually took over. In the Hunter Valley, Maitland streets were first lit at night by gas 127 years ago, and Newcastle followed six years later. While its first use was predominantly domestic, the biggest user of gas is now industry. Although New Gas claims the link to natural gas in 1982 has resulted in a tremendous increase in household use. According to Glendale Technical College, there are about 24,000 small businesses in the Hunter region. Together they represent a major employer group and yet they fold with alarming regularity. But teachers at Glendale College say that failure rate can be reduced through better management and they back that view with a practical demonstration. Over 20 students in the small business management course put the businesses they're currently operating up for scrutiny at a public display. Student David Cooper says you don't have to own a small business to enrol in the course, but it's vital to have a solid business plan to succeed later on. In today's economic climate, with three businesses a day in the hunt of failing, uh, I consider it personally very important. Uh, the course itself teaches basic practical skills in management, from stock control through to people. It's excellent. And what happens if they don't have those skills? There's a very little chance of success. The display represents just a hint of the vast range of possibilities for small businesses including everything from a video and film market to industrial cleaning, toys, landscaping, plumbing and computer systems. With a bit of luck and sound management advice these businesses will succeed where many others have gone under. The concept of a video containing information about local events and attractions is not new and in fact most major cities have for some time had their equivalent. Now Newcastle has its own version. In Newcastle today is a continuous 30 minute video which contains advertising for local leisure venues as well as information about regional attractions. Its producers say the contents will be updated monthly. The video will soon be available 24 hours a day at the flick of a switch in every room of 20 motels in the Newcastle and Lake Macquarie area. Guests select the service by simply tuning into the channel allocated by the motel. Helen Duncan, who today launched the venture, says it has the potential to be viewed by up to 10,000 travellers each week. She says the video is aimed to attract back for a longer stay those who normally only visit Newcastle for business or who are just passing through. The Computer Studies Department at Tysill Tech has become the flagship of Australia's TAFE colleges. New computer aids and significant advances in computer technology have been developed at the Tech and now the State Government has chosen it to introduce the first school of computing and information systems outside the metropolitan area. The school will offer two courses which were outlined by Paul Edwards from Sydney Technical College at a special launching dinner at Hamilton TAFE last night. Two associate diplomas will be available, one in business and microcomputing systems, the other in commercial data processing. Both courses will be open to full-time and part-time students. It's taken months of detailed market research to uncover the personnel needs of the growing computer industry and two priority areas have been revealed. One is in a fairly classical area of commercial data processing people that are going to do COBOL programming and implement systems in banks and insurance companies and places like that. But the other one is a, is a area that's come about as a function of the introduction of microcomputers in our society. Uh, enormous need, a lot of businesses installing them and they need to put their hand up and cry help and uh, there aren't many people that are available to help. 
So we're actually producing people that in two years' time will graduate and are able to help the businessmen install their computers and make them operate effectively. The 90 works selected by Holmeser Court's private curator Roderick Anderson provide an outline of the development of Western Australian art from 1827 to 1958. Traditional landscapes such as James Linton's End of the Day Swan River dominate the earlier works in the exhibition. This style remained predominant in Western Australia until the 1930s, with the obvious exception of Kathleen O'Connor, whose years spent living in Paris before the turn of the century are reflected in the strong Impressionist element in her work. The first hint of modernism in the exhibition is in the 1930s work of Elise Blumen, a refugee who brought this style with her from Europe. Last night the exhibition was officially opened at the Regent Gallery by the General Manager of the Australia Council, Max Burke. Currently sharing the space in the gallery are artworks of a decidedly different nature. The pots of artist Mutsuo Yanagihara are part of the contemporary Japanese ceramics exhibition. Yanagihara's pots are fired numerous times at low temperatures to obtain the carefully controlled glazing techniques. The work of several other noted Japanese artists are also on show, including the highly figurative creations of Shoji, who mixes pottery with gold and silver leaf to obtain a unique effect. The exhibition is on display until December 6. These airfield defence guards aren't preparing elaborate crowd control. The machine gun nest is part of the show. Of course, it's the aircraft that really pull in the crowds, like this perfectly preserved mirage in the colours of the now disbanded 76 Squadron. The air shows have been part of RAF Base Williamtown's public profile for decades, but the arrival of the Hornets created a sensation. About 100,000 people swarmed out to the base, taking traffic police and RAF supervisors completely off guard. And the attraction should be just as exciting this time. We've got a static display going all day long which will depict activities that we carry on on the base in engineering. Uh, the dogs will be on display, the ADGs will have a weapon pit that you've seen earlier and at about 12 o'clock we'll get into the flying display which will run for about three hours. And the flying display will obviously be the highlight. Uh, what's, what will that include? Well, the flying display will have military aircraft as well as civilian aircraft. The military side of things will see a comparison between the Hornet and the uh, Mirage, which will just show the difference between the, uh, the two types of aircraft. The RAF base has cut three new gates into the perimeter fence to make sure everyone gets in, and the police have prepared an elaborate network of alternative routes to get people to the base. Reports have been flowing that the federal government is offering the state government a $20 million package for the ailing coal industry. The package is reported to be dependent on the state government putting in double this amount so that the industry receives a total of $60 million in assistance. But Premier Unsworth made it very clear today that he's not happy with the offer and that nothing has been finalised. I had a meeting with the Treasurer on Friday when I was in Canberra and uh, at this stage there are still details to be finalised. We're not satisfied with the proposal that uh, has been leaked from Canberra which uh, suggests that the funding uh, package should be on a two for one basis. We believe that uh, the funding should be 50-50 between ourselves and the Commonwealth. Mr Unsworth also hit out at reports that it was a package to rescue the state government in the forthcoming state election. And uh, I must also reject some suggestions that have been made in the media that this is some sort of rescue package uh, for the New South Wales government. I want to say this, that coal is one of our principal export income earners and uh, if we're going to address the uh, imbalance that we have in our terms of trade, we have to ensure that we continue to export coal. 
Peter Morris, who is Acting Federal Energy Minister while John Kerrin is in Rome, made it clear that only those coal mines that have a chance of surviving will get assistance. Well, there are some mines in the current world market. They're going to find it very difficult to manage anyway. And rather, we should look at it as a restructuring package, as we've done in the textile industry, as we've done in the steel industry. So we need to do in the coal industry. And when we get through this, this period, of market flatness, then we'll be able to pick up and maximise opportunities in the future. And what we need to do is, if there's to be help from federal government, we have to identify that. If there's to be help from federal government, from state government rather, then we have to identify that and to which mines and under what conditions should be given. There has also to be a commitment from mine owners in terms of continuity of employment for the workforce, and then from the workers themselves, from the unions. Several thousand plane lovers took up the Air Force's invitation to visit Williamtown RAAF base for the open day, although numbers were significantly down on the last open day in August 1985. On that occasion, the first public display of the then newly arrived FA-18 Hornets attracted thousands of visitors and created horrific traffic snarls which the police and Air Force were ill-equipped to handle. A mixture of aircraft history filled the skies over Williamtown, a graphic illustration of what one lifetime of technology has meant to the world of flying. Displays range from the grace of a ribbon-cutting First World War Tiger Moth to some spectacular flying by an impeccably restored vampire jet fighter. The vampire was taken out of service by the RAAF in 1970. The FA-18s were of course the stars of the show and the Air Force was obviously keen to demonstrate just what their pilots had learned to do with the aircraft. Then a telling demonstration of the virtues of two engines over one as a Hornet proceeded to relegate a Mirage to the ranks of historic aircraft. While the latter was still trying to lift its nose, the FA-18 was rocketing in a vertical climb thousands of feet above before neatly outmanoeuvring the older aircraft. According to police, this Holden Commodore sedan was travelling north at about 4pm yesterday afternoon. As the car headed down the Orimba Hill towards the F3 freeway, witnesses say it just appeared to leave the road, going into the grass verge before hitting the beginning of the guardrail head on. The car was sliced in half on impact and crumpled like a can. Police say there were no skid marks indicating the driver may have fallen asleep and no other vehicle was involved. The driver and one passenger sitting in the front seat were killed while a passenger sitting in the rear of the car was rushed to Gosford Hospital where he remains in a critical condition. Yes, to today's launching of the week-long Black Friday road safety campaign were treated to a display of advanced driver training. This is one way to demonstrate the theme of the safety campaign, accidents aren't just bad luck, they're caused. But these advanced driving graduates aren't the problem, they already have the right attitude. Chairman of the New South Wales Standing Committee on Safety, Brian Langton, says laws and controls can't work without driver support. Unless we can get the message out, unless we can start to change people's attitudes and people's behavioural patterns, then really we're not going to achieve very much. Brian Langton says he objects to road smashes even being referred to as accidents. He says wider use of seat belts, helmets and random breath testing are more effective ways of saving lives than leaving it to luck. The Black Friday Road Safety Week will spread its message across the state, but Mr Langton says it's appropriate that it starts in Newcastle. Deputy Director of the New South Wales National Safety Council, Laurie Nicholson, says the Hunter region nears the top of the list for road deaths and injuries. Many of them are socio-economic reasons, uh, others are reasons related to uh, employment, for example. Unemployed people mightn't be able to fix up their cars. Uh, some people related to the roads. 
Uh, but uh, whatever the conditions under which a person is driving, uh, it is the attitude of that person which is the important thing because one should adjust to those conditions. Laurie Nicholson says the council won't change attitudes overnight, but active support from the media, schools, police and motorists will turn the death rate around. It has not been the best season for the 28-year-old. Just prior to the national championships, he fell from his bike during training, breaking his cheekbone. During the nationals, he had mechanical problems, which saw him lose valuable time and drop from the top five to 16th place. And last week in the tour of New Zealand, competing for Australia for the first time, a horror accident sent his and the Australian team's chances crashing. There was a big fall along, along a straight stretch of road where it shouldn't have really happened, but. Uh I did, someone touched the wheel and um, three of the Australian riders were amongst the ones that fell. There was 15 riders all together that fell, I was amongst them, but I didn't, didn't really uh, get hurt. But uh, our team leader Barney St George was hurt badly and couldn't continue. And uh, The riders that did continue lost a lot of time in that stage and it put us right out of contention in the team's classification. David did go on to complete the race, finishing in 30th place. Teachers from about 320 Hunter Valley primary and secondary schools attended stop work meetings at Cardiff, Maitland and Musselbrook. They're angered by a breakdown in wage talks between the Teachers Federation and the state government. According to the Federation, the government has rejected proposed economies to offset a 4% second tier wage increase, choosing instead to introduce their own constraints, especially in the area of relief teaching time. Federation Vice President Janet McLean says the measures would be detrimental to teachers and students. It will be very, very inconvenient for students every day of their learning career if they are going to have to be split up and put into other teachers' classes. And this is one of the provisions that the government wants. They want us to have, they don't want to provide relief for teacher absences. The proposed 24-hour strike next Thursday is already endorsed by the Federation Executive. Although higher school certificate markers are also involved, Janet McLean says students won't be affected. I have doubts as to whether we will be doing things to affect the HSC marking and the HSC students. What we will do is try and win the 4%, which is our right. We have been tightening our belts for years and years, and it is our right to have this increase.